going to read a little passage, uh, the passage that actually came from Kaylee, mm -hmm. uh, because as Jane said, she is a wonderful editor, and uh, she took my story, read it, and made some suggestions, and uh, this part sort of came to me uh, thanks to her. Um, so um, it's a little way into the story. All you have to know, though, is that this is a grandmother. Most of this story, I will say, uh, is true, um, but obviously dramatized. Um, but uh, this is a grandmother. She's 60, and her daughter, uh, has, um, who's also a professor, um, has left her two children with the grandmother. Uh, the eldest girl is um, uh, 13, and there's a little boy who's uh, 9. Uh, and the grandmother has left the little boy uh, on the beach after something of an argument, and she says, well, you just find your own way back. Uh, and she, as she leaves the beach, she sees a man with a tattoo of a snake on his arm. She's uh, embarked on a, she's writing a book on French, on the French Revolution. In her big, cool bedroom, she strips off her shorts and her bathing suit and showers. Under the water, she thinks with relief that she'll have a little while to work before he returns. She's fascinated by the lives of these brave women who lived through such difficult times with courage and dignity and wrote about it. She imagines her grandson <coughs> strolling slowly and sulkily along the road, kicking at pebbles. She doesn't like children who sulk. She considers she never sulked as a child. Of course, she got angry, but it never lasted. For a second, she imagines how much easier her daughter's life would have been if she'd had only one child. Emma teaches four classes all through the year to large numbers of students who demonstrate little intellectual curiosity. She has to grade hundreds of papers, meet recalcitrant, rude students who have little respect for her, and attend endless meetings, the arduous, grueling, badly paid work of the adjunct professor. She remembers her daughter calling to tell her she was pregnant again, just after she'd enrolled in graduate school. How will you cope with two children and your studies? Are you sure you want to do this? Stella had asked. Well, she's done it, with great courage and determination, but at what cost to herself and her children? I'll skip a little bit. After a while, she glances at her watch and realizes it's considerably later than she thought. The sun is high and it's hot and still and the house dead quiet. She runs up the stairs and peeps into the bedrooms. Rose still sleeps, sprawled untidily across the double bed in her pink pajamas amongst a pile of beanie babies. But Mark's room is ominously quiet. She runs down the stairs and out the front door. She looks across the shadowy driveway but can see no sign of him. Her heart beating like a drum. Her hands sweating with panic, she climbs onto her bicycle and pedals recklessly down the street, looking left and right. The hot sun pierces through ragged cloud. The sun and shade fall on her face. Perspiration pours down her forehead and her back. She rides to the beach where she abandoned the little boy and strides wildly up and down, pushing her way through the people who are now arriving in large groups and stare at her with curiosity as she makes her way rudely, stepping on people's towels, knocking over baskets, rushing down to the sea. But there's no sign of him there. She thinks of her daughter's words. He's totally unaware of danger. She stands at the edge of the waves, which seem to have gotten higher. The sea much rougher now. The waves pound the sand with an angry crash. She puts her hand to her forehead, scrutinizing the water, the sun catch it, cutting a wild, wide silver swath on the slate-colored sea. She imagined Mark's little body tossed onto the beach before her. Her mouth is dry with fear. Could he have gone swimming after all? Could he have gone into this rough sea in a rage and drowned?